Blessed be everybody. Hello and welcome to episode nine. Can you guys believe it? We're on episode nine. We have a very special guest. I'd like to introduce Chris. Uh, Chris, I'm sorry. What was your last name? Smith. Smith. Chris Smith. Uh, very interesting person. Um, I'm going to ask just like one or two questions and then I'll let Matt take over. Sorry, Matt's over here. Uh, my co-host, Matt Collins. Uh, of course, is joining us. And like I said, he will take over the uh, line of questioning. Um, uh, we were just discussing that I'm actually re-watching a TV show that I stopped watching and I shouldn't have. But anyway, Chris, uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm, I know there's a little bit of a time difference. It's like, what, five o'clock there, three o'clock? It's uh, eight minutes past two in the morning at the moment. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. Um, so tell us, uh, you are pagan, is that correct? I am, yes. I prefer the term heathen, actually, because oh. that's <laughs> What a wonderful, yeah, I always say that, uh, I kind of say that in passing, when people, we have a church right near our place, and um, I always say, go get to church, heathen, get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's just a whole bunch of people always in that church, and I'm just like, even at four in the morning, there's people there. I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> but anyway, Chris, so glad you could join us, even though it is kind of, you know, very early in the UK right now. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get on your path, and uh, what brought you to basically uh wanting to do paganism well that's a very long story but um <laughs> <try laughs> we have and, a lot of time trust me <laughs> i'll try and make it brief um uh when i was about 19 just after i got to university i first developed an interest in magic and um I still considered myself a, a Christian at that point, because as most people, you know, at that time were, I was brought up as a Christian. Three years later, um, I, uh, I knew a little bit about magic and I decided that uh, I really wasn't a Christian anymore. And I thought, so what do I believe in? And uh i thought let's look at the the old gods of britain and um mm -hmm. so at that time i tended towards wicca and uh so you know i, I went into the, uh, the 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 wiccan way and Years later, after that, I founded a, a Wiccan coven here in uh, North Yorkshire, England. And uh, but I realised that <clears throat> I strongly tended towards the the northern path, which looked. I mean, Wicca very often tends to follow a, a Mediterranean trend of, of looking towards Mediterranean uh, their gods and goddesses. I definitely believed in the Northern Pantheon. And so I came away from Wicca and then I became, as I say, a heathen, um, which is the, you know, the, the Northern term for a pagan. And um, so I've been that since, uh, since my mid thirties, so I, I think, and, uh, and I'm 69 going on 70 now. So, um, you know, so I, I've been, uh, I've been a pagan or a heathen for pretty much all my life, you know, so um, it's uh, ever since I really consciously devoted some thought to religion. So I hope that answers your question. You know, it's. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what, what did you admire about the uh, northern path? Um, I believe the Vikings would call were called heathens. Um, if I remember correctly. Well, no, heathen is, is actually a Christian term applied to people who followed the uh, the elder path of the uh, of the northern peoples, the, the, the pre-Christian path. So it's a Christian term, but we adopt it. And okay. what I admire about the about the about the modern faith. As opposed, it's we can only reconstruct the ancient faith, really. But about the the neo pagan modern heathen faith, what I admire about it 
is that it is less prescriptive than Christianity or any of the Abrahamic religions. And in the Abrahamic religions, you get a lot of uh, thou shalt not, and um, and you don't get that with, with the heathen faith. It's, it's very tolerant on the whole, and um, you know, you it's rather libertarian. You go with whatever floats your boat, you know. It's, <laughs> although they, the, the heathens do tend to have a stronger emphasis on sticking to the old law in as far as possible. Um, that we, we look at the, the law of what we know of the old religion and we try to stick closely to that. It's not always possible, but um, uh, but we do try to stick closely to it. I mean, uh, <laughs> there are some things that we don't really want anymore, like human sacrifice or even animal sacrifice. Um, I certainly wouldn't want that. Um, but uh, we try to stick to the, the old law insofar as possible. Would you say you're kind of like the Druids in, in a way? Didn't, weren't the Dru Druids known for their sacrifice? But yet they did it to communicate with the gods. So um, yeah. I'm not really sure. Well, the, the Druidism, modern Druidism, again, is a, is a construct. It is, it's a reconstructed old religion. Now, the Romans wrote about the Druids back in the days of uh, Tacitus, for example. And um, what they wrote was very colored by their, their own preconceptions. But apparently the Druids um, performed human sacrifices, which was anathema to the Romans. Mm -hmm. and the Romans used to perform animal sacrifices, but definitely not human sacrifices. And um, I don't know how close we are to the, the the religion of the Druids or even to the, the modern Druids. It it really holds no interest for me because it's a it's a Celtic um, idea, and I'm very much drawn to Germanic ideas because mm -hmm. the English are a Germanic people. Um. Would you say when you got into interested in magic, were you kind of like a, a fly by the hip or did you like tradition, traditional magic? Um, did you follow any kind of, you know, um, pagan magic, I think, is a combination of both. So when you get into the modern paganism, um, you can choose either or. I know in Wicca we can choose, uh, we can just make our own magic and do the, you know, fly by the seat of our pants, so to speak. Um, or we can do the old traditional where we have, you know, words are written and um, wh which do you prefer to do, uh, which is easier for you to do or which one it kind of draws you towards it? Over the years, I've um, learned to very much make it up as I go along and, and I, I write my own uh, little rites and, um, and prayers and uh, and I use those. When I first came to uh, the use of Northern magic, I really didn't know very much about it. This is going back to about the early to mid 1980s. I, I'd seen something about the runes in as a as an annex to um, uh, what was it? Um, Buckland's book, The Tree. Um, it was a handbook of, of um, Saxon witchcraft, I think that was the subtitle. And um, so in the book, he had basic, very basic low church kind of wicca um, and in which Woden and Freya were the god and the goddess. And the appendices at the back, you got um, some rows of the runes, which were merely appended as a kind of form of secret writing. There were various other rows as well of, um, uh, of witchcraft, uh, of passing the river and other witchy sort of um, writings. But the runes generally really attracted me. They were calling to me. They, they asked me to investigate them. 
And I had a couple of false starts. Um, I saw um, Bloom's book, the little book of runes in, in a charity shop. And I I bought it for, you know, maybe a, a pound or two. And, and I flicked through it and I thought immediately, this guy just doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. So I took it back to the charity shop and gave it to them. Then at Yuletide, my parents bought me um, David and Julia Lyne's book of fortune telling with runes. And I read that and I had a couple of questions. Now you have to remember this is in the days before email. Um, so I, I wrote them handwritten letters and I got handwritten letters in reply. And um, I asked a, a question or a couple of questions and I got a reply and uh, and then I had a further question and the answer that I got with the second reply was a little bit snotty and uh, and I thought well these guys don't they don't like being questioned and they 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 don't know what they're talking about either third time lucky I um, I found uh, Edward Thorson's book, Futhark, and there was something about that that really shone out, and I felt that um, this guy really knew what he was talking about, and I would still recommend that book, Futhark, to, to any beginner these days, even though Edward says it's the worst book that he ever wrote, but then again, it's, it's the first book that he ever wrote for the public, so it's, uh, that's the way it should be. And, uh, and it's still a good book today. So he made, you know, he makes up various rituals in Futhark. For example, the ritual for if you want to create a, a, a talisman, then there are various rites for going out to the tree and explaining to it, talking to it, explaining to it, offering to it, explaining why you want the time. The, the the twig and then uh, coming back to it and infusing it with uh, rune the runes that you want to use cutting the tine taking it back and uh, and then creating your talisman and I'm realizing that well this isn't an ancient rite Edward Thorson made it up and if he made it up I can make up rites as well. And although I'm not, I wouldn't class myself soundly as a chaos magician, I'm very much influenced by chaos magic. And I find it very vibrant and energetic and, and that encourages innovation. And so, you know, my brand of magic is a, is a, a mixture of old lore and chaos magic, basically. Can you explain what is chaotic magic? Can you explain that for us? With chaos magic, it, it's chaos magic was a it, it's a movement that was, that began um, in Leeds. I begin, I, I believe, in the late nineteen seventies, and um, when I first made contact with it in the later nineteen eighties. I knew um, Phil Hine, who's a leading figure in that uh, in that movement. Um, the my present um, Dritten in the uh, in the Rune Guild is is an ex head of the of, of the IOT, the Illuminates of Thanateros, which is the Chaos Magic organization. And so is Dave Lee, who was my mentor, my my master when I was um, learning rune magic. And um, chaos magic, it's, it's a very innovative um, form of magic, which takes various traditions as its roots um, and encourages you, uh, the, 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 the magician, to think outside the box. Uh, so, you know, you 
you could take, uh, for example, Kabbalah as your tradition, um, but that's uh, that's a a very deep subject indeed. And um, but or you could take Northern magic, or you could take um, you know the the various strands of magic that emerged through the Middle Ages. Um, you focus on those and um, and then try to recreate something a um, a working a spell in accordance with those traditions that you're working with or you can combine them you know it's a bit like um what's the um fusion cookery you know it's uh, it's, it's a bit like that and the, the basic precept as far as i can see it is hell if it works use it Mm -hmm. so that's chaos magic for you okay um so can you explain why why the north uh what is the north um uh are you talking about the norse gods like odin uh what made you what drew you to uh to odin and to the norse norse gods or norse gods um and do you, when you do, um, <clears throat> well, let's start with that one first. I'm sorry. <laughs> one thing at a time. <laughs> what drew me to the North Northern gods? Well, um, I'm an Englishman. And the English are a Northern people. I have a preference for Germanic languages. I, I studied German at school and I learned Dutch subsequently. Um, I also became reasonably fluent in Icelandic a few years ago, though I've, I've forgotten most of it now, but I did over <laughs> the course of eight months, got up to the point where I could hold a conversation in Icelandic. Um, yeah, I have a preference for that direction. It appeals to me. It, it seems to resonate with my blood. And uh, that's why I go for the, the northern path. Uh, you know, the, you know, the names of the pantheon were um, uh, Woden and Thunor in English. Uh, so Odin and Odin, sorry, and, and uh, Thor in Icelandic, Old Norse, but it, it just appeals to me more than anything else. Sprechen Sie Deutsch, eh? Ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch, ich habe... Ein bisschen, ein bisschen. No, yeah. Yeah, ein bisschen. Uh, yeah. For Yara. Me too. <laughs> um, that's really cool. Um, yeah, I took four years in German, and as you said, you forgot most the Icelandic, and I forgot most of the German that I learned. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I'm most like I'm half German with a little Irish in the German, so half German, and then half right. Swiss on the other side. So, right. Uh, um, well, it's a question of use it or lose it with languages. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and we didn't really get to talk much German because there's not a lot of German people coming to America and you know we know why. Um let's uh let's take it to uh because I I wasn't sure if you were going to make it tonight. I thought uh <laughs> Matt was talking about someone else um but I thought he was talking about you um, so the goddess I call to is Hecate. Can you explain which one calls to you uh, and who you would call for like one of your rituals? Uh, Woden is the one who appeals to me most. He's the god of poetry and war, uh, of communication and travel. And all those things have been big factors in my life. Um, uh, war, I was a territorial army officer in my youth. Um, poetry, right? I write poetry on occasions. I'm not very good at it, but I do. Communication, I spent 
most of my working life as a freelance translator. So I, you know, translated millions of words from Dutch into English. And obviously I've, I've written three books of my own. So, you know, the communication aspect is there myself. I prize language. I'm, I'm a bit of a language pedant. You know, if, if someone says, uh, oh, there are less people here, I say, no, there are fewer people here. You know, th that kind of distinction. Um, or, or even if I don't say it, I'll probably think it. Um, so, yeah, I, I prize language. I, I, I love words. I, I love the art of in writing not to use the same adjective or simile twice if you can help it that was taught to me at a very young age at school is you know don't repeat yourself don't don't say the same word over and over again um you use a try to use a different word don't just say you know nice all the time oh i had a nice day i uh, that was a that was a nice bus driver or you use another <laughs> I had an enjoyable day. I had a, you know, that was a that was a pleasant bus driver, um, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah, I, we we were taught well in English in those days, and um, and I try to uh, apply those principles today. In your books, or just in general, or both? Both, both. both. I mean, it, you know, it's um, in 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 my everyday speech I, I i use colloquialisms as much as anybody else and um i uh you know occasionally lapse into yorkshireisms but uh but on the whole i try to <coughs> speak correctly <laughs> so um yeah, and most people can't recognize any accent in my voice these days. It's um, uh, I know, I a little tiny bit, a tiny bit. Yeah. A little bit, but that's okay. Um, so you like the proper usage of English? Yeah, but I also like improper uses of usage of English <laughs> in in the sense that um, you know I think it's a shame that we've lost a lot of our dialects over the past hundred years. And <clears throat> that is getting, that process is accelerating with, and it's down to mass communication. I mean, when I hear Northern kids today using the glottal stop and saying bottle instead of bottle, you know, that's, and that's been happening for the past maybe 30, 40 years and, and it, I find it almost shocking um, because they've picked it up from watching programs on TV. And and then this Australian rising note at the end of sentences. You know what I mean? You know, this kind of thing. Um, and, and, I, and I went to I went to the shops and uh, and then I then I bought some Coca-Cola and you know <laughs> You know, I think, why? You know, why why use that? And it's it's all come from abroad. I can't say in, uh, in American English. I can't say American English is any better. Uh, now we just have like, you know, sick. I'm like, sick what? What? Yeah. Someone sick? <laughs> or, yeah. Exactly. Or, uh, yeah. Like, uh, oh man, that's so sick. Or or hey, I'm a cis woman. What? Yeah. you're a what <laughs> i didn't yeah. know, i mean i'm like well what, what does that mean you're a cis woman what what does that mean <laughs> I mean yeah i, I, I get I, I, I do try to keep abreast you know of, of the modern fads and <laughs> uh you know and, and you're a cis woman a, a straight woman you know it's yeah prefers, yeah. It prefers men you know but um yeah well it, it, it is all just fadism, really. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but we had our fads when I was a young man, you know, so we used oh, to. You're still a young man. Food. You're still a young man yet. You still got <laughs> plenty of time. Um, I hope so. 
but the burning question we all want to know is do you like the Beatles? Um, <laughs> did you like the Beatles? <laughs> yeah, I did like the Beatles. Okay. I, 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 I liked them. I liked their music. It was quite revolutionary at the time. Um, you know, and then around about 1966, 67, they underwent a sea change and uh, you know their their music changed and i think got a lot more interesting because you know i think something like strawberry fields is a far more interesting song than i want to hold your hand uh, so which yeah. is why they came to america in the first place because they had heard of so many english uh composers or singers uh back in the 60s who had not made it here uh, they were great in Britain. They had made it to number one. They were very hip and, you know, they were at the top of the charts. Um, but then, you know, they came to America and just kind of went pfft, like a, a a pancake, you know, just kind of imploded on itself. And um, <clears throat> so I, their first hit was I Want to Hold Your Hand. And when it came over here. Yeah, it wasn't. It was love, love, love me do, I think. But I'm not yeah. sure. I wouldn't argue about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Let Me Do was very popular in Britain. Very, very, mm. very popular in Britain. And then um, I'm a walking encyclopedia. I have their pretty much anything about the Beatles. You can just ask me. I had their anthology um, somewhere. I have their anthology somewhere. <laughs> I have movies about them. Of course, uh, there's Nowhere Boy uh, about John Lennon. Um, and then there's, of course, the birth of the Beatles. So um, most of the, what I have, I usually got from from there. In fact, I told my dad, I'm like, you do realize George Harrison and them got kicked out of Germany? He's like, why? I said, because George Harrison wasn't 18. <laughs> Oops. Um, but anyway, uh, back to the magic and back to uh, I just wanted to kind of you know, cool everybody's jets and see, uh, cause, uh, my soulmate and I had just seen, uh, the, uh, Paul is dead com uh, conspiracy. Excuse me. I couldn't say the word. Um, yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think honestly, my thing is, uh, it's cool and all, but, uh, I think it was just the Beatles wanted to sell more records and because they were kind of dwindling towards the end of the sixties and, um, they kind of needed a conspiracy to get them back to number one because once they did that, uh, they were actually selling more records than they ever had. So, um, yeah, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that conspiracy until 1979. Mm -hmm. um, it was part of my introduction to the Dutch language because I'd um, uh, bought myself a little radio and I used to pick up the Dutch newspapers every day and read it to familiarize myself with the language. And there was a program on Dutch radio about it, about this Paul is dead conspiracy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, I remember it distinctly sitting in my little apartment in, um, in Leiden and, um, uh, and, and listening to that in Dutch. So. So you are 69 or you were 69? No, I'm, I am 69. I'm, I'm halfway to being 70. Okay. Will you be 70 this year? Yeah. Yeah, I will. This, okay. This so you were born in 54. My dad and mom were born in 55. So um, yeah. they just became 69 this, this, yeah. uh, this year. Um, so, uh, I have uh, kind of dabbled with the, um, I do admire Freya uh, because she is kind of the mother goddess or the mother rune or uh, however you want to see her. She's kind of like the mother of, of um, you know, Thor and, and stuff. No, uh, I get that right. Freya. Free, free, freak. Free, freak. Is, freak. Is, is the, Thank you. Is the, <clears throat> no, actually, uh, Earth is the mother of Thor. Yeah. Earth, yours is the mother of Thor. She was Odin's first spouse. Spouse, wife. Boy, and uh, and then uh, and then Frigg becomes his second, and and has uh, Loki, right? And no, no, uh, we don't know where Loki comes from. Okay, he just kind of snuck in there. 
Well, he's, Which is his well, he, 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 he has different parents. Okay. Yeah. But he, he was always yeah. the mischievous one, just kind of slid in there, you know. Yeah, he's uh, Loki. Is <laughs> is is um Odin's blood brother, but okay. um, but he, he's he's actually more of the giant kin than the than than the than he is of the ice here. So yeah, the the um, no, the Baldur is the son of Frigg. Okay. And, and okay. Odin. But she is the mother. Um, she kind of, you know, is like that motherly figure that everyone yeah, kind of well, talks about. Well, you yeah. have to dis yeah, you have to distinguish between Frigg and Freya. Frigg is is uh, of the ice here, and she's um, she's Odin's uh, wife and consort. Freya is the daughter of Njorth, and she. Um, is of the Vanir race, but she lives among the Aesir, along with her brother Frey, or Freyr, with an R at the end. Yep, Freyr. Uh, who is also is the son of Njorth. And Njorth mm -hmm. was one of the hostages who was exchanged after the first great war between uh, the Aesir and Vanir. And, and so, what do they call their home? The ice here? Oh, well, just they their call... home in general. Is it Valhalla yeah, also... or something else? No, uh, Valhalla is part of Osgarth. Okay. Osgarth, which is um, which is the the Garth, which from which we um, derive our modern word yard mm -hmm. uh, and the an enclosure. <clears throat> um, it's it's the enclosure of the ice here, and and an os is is the old word for a god, in one of the old words for the, for a god, in in the Norse tongue. There are others. Many others. <laughs> well, I mean, the for, or something. <laughs> well, for example, you know, um, Gother uh, uh, got. Is, is 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 one word from which we derive our modern word god um, but also tear although he is a very specific taken as a very specific god these days was also used as a general word for a god in the um, old norse pantheon for example um Odin is sometimes referred to as hangatir that had the hanged god Very interesting. All right. Uh, I will let uh, my co-host, Matt, take over the questioning from here. But thank you for answering all my questions. I'm interested to You're hear welcome. what Matt has. Hi, Matthew. Good to see Good you. Evening. Good to see you. So Christopher Allen Smith uh, recently published Snorri, The Afterlife Adventures of Snorri Sturluson. And um, I bet people would be mighty interested to hear why Snorri is important to the Norse lore. And I'm sure you're the man to tell him. Yeah, Snorri Sturluson. Well, for us, as modern northern magicians and, and heathens, he's um, a giant of a man, really, because if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't know half what we know about the, you know, the ancient northern pantheon. Uh, what would we have if it wasn't for Snorri Sturluson? We would have um, a few hints in ancient proscriptions, prescriptive laws saying, you know, you mustn't worship this god or that god, um, or you mustn't worship at shrines and, and springs and stones. Um, there, there would perhaps be a few folk legends um, uh, around, but Snorri who was a very educated man, and he was an Icelander, uh, who spent quite a lot of time at the courts of Norwegian kings. He actually wrote it all up uh, in the 13th century, and, and nobody else did this. Nobody else had, had really done this. And so in his work, the, the, what we, which we call the Prose Edda, and in the Heimskringla, 
um, the, the uh, story of, of the um, uh, of the kings of Norway. He gave us so much information about what was believed or what he thought was believed about the ancient gods. And we have to remember that um, Snorri himself was brought up as a Christian, although there are indications that his family may have been pagans, uh, heathens, long after the Christianization. It was a, it was a gradual process, of course. But um, uh, he, he lived into the mid-13th century. And when he wrote the Prose Edda, it was actually a, a textbook of poetry. And he wanted to preserve the, the old uh, ways of writing poetry, which he felt were being pushed out in favor of, of other foreign influences. And, and so it, his Prose Edda was a, was a textbook of, of Old Norse poetry. And in order to get this over, he felt he had to say quite a lot about the the old Norse gods, because that was very much the subject matter of, of, of the ancient poetry. So he, he had to write all this up. And uh, how did you start writing story? What inspired you? Well, what inspired me, the story first, his first title in my head was The Property Developers. And the, the question in my mind, uppermost in my mind, was, you know, the, the prime story in the beginning of how Odin and his two brothers, Vili and Vir, uh, they decided to slay Ymir, the first giant, and they killed him. And they broke up his body to uh, to, to form the, the heavens and the earth and Ausgarth uh, uh, and Midgarth. And I thought, well, how would the giants view that? How would the giants themselves view it? And knowing from history, because I love history, that you know it's, it's the winner who writes the history uh, and the accepted history. I thought maybe there was another story. Maybe there was the loser's story behind this that nobody has ever told. And so my aim was to get to the way the giants saw it. And that's why I leave this right to the end of the book, which you've read now. And um, so that was how the story came. And I, I, having read the Prose Edda, and in particular, Gulfa Ginning, which is the, the, the first book of, of the Prose Edda, where um, King, or, or the, the traveler Gilfi, goes and finds out all about the, uh, the ancient gods in a, um, in a mystical journey and has things explained to him. I took Snorri as, as my example and thought, well, yeah, what if Snorri died and then was taken on a mystical journey and had things explained to him about all the things that he got wrong in the store in his stories? And yeah, it it, it I, I forget when I, I exactly when I started writing this. It was in 2009 or 2010. And um, it stayed on the back hob for a long, long while until I'd had my second book published, um, Vegvisir. And well, after Vegvisir was published, that's the one. I um, I felt a, a bit like you know another child has flown the nest. It's out there, and I felt a little bit bereft, and I thought. What do I start talking about now? What do I write now? So I returned to this 
story that I'd had on the back hob for years and decided to make something of it. And um, uh, and I wrote it in, I think, about nine months. I'm very glad you did. Um, so where does Skirner uh, come into play with all this? Yes, yeah, Skirner. Um, spoiler alert, everybody. This is, um, you know, if you haven't read the book yet, then uh, maybe you better tune out now because uh, I'm going to be, you know, Matt and I are going to be giving away quite a lot of um, stuff about it. Now, Skirnir, we only know him from Skirnis Mol, uh, which is a book of the, the Poetic Edda. And that's a story where um, Skirnir, well, Frey, the god Frey, climbs one day in Odin's absence onto Odin's throne of Thyskiel, from which he can view the entirety of, entirety of everything. He can see into all the worlds from this magical throne. And in the distance, he sees uh, a beautiful apparition of shining light, who is the god, uh, sorry, the giantess, Gerth, and he's struck by her beauty and he longs for her. But unable to go to her himself, he sends for his companion and servant, Skirnir, whose name means Shiner. And he says to Skirnir, I want you to go over to Gerth in Ettingholm and woo her on my behalf. And then Skirnir goes over to Ettingholm. And when he, at one point, when he's challenged, he and, and then the challenger says to him, what kind of being are you? And he says, I forget the exact words, I'm neither ace, a god, and, and nor, um, nor, nor Vanir, or, uh, and, and, or elf, or man. So it leaves you thinking, well, what am I, what is he then? And I thought, well, who is none of these? And my answer is, he's a magician. He's, he's a developed man, who a, a superman who's become more than a man. So that's, that's the answer. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. I love that. Oh, let's see. Um, well, then uh, it talks about costing me an arm and a leg uh, for Freyr to take Odin's seat. And I wonder if you want to Yeah. Say <laughs> well, this is the scene where um, where uh, Snorri and um, and Skirnir are being treated to a visit to this high seat of Hlithskjall for Odin's high seat. And um, yeah, so Odin, they're talking about this episode between Frey and, and Gerth and, uh, and Odin reminds Shiner that it cost him an arm and a leg and Shiner is sort of, oh yeah, I do. because he he sent, uh, or um, Frey sent uh, Skirnir away with gifts of um, of his own sword and, and of Draupnir, which is uh, the, the ring of the armband of Odin, which drips nine rings every ninth night and um, it uh, rings as big as itself. And he sends these things off. And so that's why Odin says, yeah, well, that cost me an arm and a leg, you know, because I'll never see that back again. Um, um, you know, I'm going to yeah. jump around to Big Vistir for a second. Um, mm -hmm. I just ask, how do you write such perfect binaries? Because I love the way that you 
make them just so artistically perfect, in my opinion. Well, I had a lot of help with that, to be honest, because um, when I when I wrote the book, I'm just looking at my own copy now. Um, uh, I had um, I was writing them with simply with a felt pen and then copying them. Now, then I had um, well, take this. I think this is an example of what, what you mean. If I can, whoops, where are we? Like that? Yeah, and uh, a very good friend of mine called Case Hauser. He he had the 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 kit with the graphics to to reproduce that. So I would write it in felt pen and send it to him, and then. And he'd come up with, uh, with with something that was far more attractive, you know, to the eye. So um, that, that's how that's how we got there. Yeah. Excellent. I had to ask. <laughs> yeah. Um. Um. Well. Um. How about the blind guards in uh, in Snorri? I thought that was a very interesting part. The blind guards. Yeah. Oh, that's purely my imagination. Um, I thought, uh, you know, when I'm picturing a scene, I, I, it, I don't know. I just let my imagination run riot, and and the, the scene comes to me, and so I'm imagining a, a mound on top of a hill. You know something similar maybe to um uh clifford's tower in york which is you know quite a or, or silbury hill you know quite a steep climb and um imagining these um this flight of wooden steps going up there and uh, and at the top well, since Freya went and managed to sit on the seat um, without being impeded, since then, Aldin has put a couple of guards in place. But he doesn't want the guards being tempted to abuse the position of the seat, so they're blind. So he's, he's picked out a couple of warriors from Valhalla who were blinded in, in action when, when they were still alive. And so he's put those into place and they can, their, their other senses have become perfected. You know, their, their hearing and their sense of distance their, and their sense of touch, um, as, as you quite often see with blind people. I mean, I, I have worked with blind people myself. And um, so, yeah, that, that was the inspiration for that. And uh, how much, how important does imagination come into writing a fiction book instead of a nonfiction book? Oh, enormously, you know, and, and it's a great sense of freedom that you get because you can, you know, you can just let your imagination run riot. And uh, with my first book, Icelandic Magic, I had to be very precise and detailed because th this was my masterwork for the guild, and uh, and uh, I had to justify just about everything that I said, and and to be able to come back with the the exact references. Uh, Vekvisir was perhaps a little easier um, because I was just you know writing a, a an instructive book of magic and and saying, well, folks, this is the way I do it. Take it or leave it um but i had to be fairly precise with that as well and 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 you know think of various contingencies writing snorri well that was that was a heap of fun big all i needed to do was make sure that i was reasonably consistent in it and you know if anybody says well you you're not consistent here because this this and this and i'll say well heck it's a fantasy man you know you what do you expect and um, I mean, the, there were times when I 
well, most of the time, I didn't know where, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't know where the next chapter was going to lead or go to. Um, and I remember, for example, uh, you know, I'd finished the episode about his visit to the Vanir, and I thought, right, okay, where where to now? Where do we go now? And a uh, visit to um, Light Elfholm, your cell phone, suggested itself. And I thought, well, yeah, what about what? What is it with the your soul file, the light elves? What should I write about them? And I was walking on my daily walk with with the dogs in in my local park. And uh, yeah, we've got some very nice parkland. And then there's a specific area where I've got there's a group of trees of various species which I consider my special friends. And um, one of them is a willow, which I at first taken to be female and in the past year or two found it's a male because I, I got my book out and exact, examined the flowers and, and it turned out to be a male. Uh, so, um, you know, that came as quite a surprise. But anyway, I, I asked him, I said, what do you know of the, um, of the light elves? Because I always associate this particular tree with Elfland, and it's, it's my elf willow. And I said, what do you know of the light elves? And he told me, he said, um, they live on air. They, um, they wear no clothes, and they do no work at all. And, and it, it, somehow it reminded me of... Um, that song uh, that Steel Eye Span made famous, Fat Tom of Bedlam. Um, I don't know if you remember it, um, but they all go bare and they live on the air and they want no drink nor money. So, you know, this was, this was my picture of the light elves. Well, that's beautiful. And uh, for folks who might know, um, might you explain the importance of the land to uh, northern people? The importance of the land. Uh, in what particular respect are you thinking with with the book? Um, well, uh, just to explain what a land white is, uh, you know, that land spirit. Mm. Well, to for northern people, which includes, you know, the the English, the Icelanders, the Germans, the Dutch, the Scandinavians. The, the, the land is inhabited by uh, white beings um, uh, who are non-human, but uh, may attain or may be endowed with anthropomorphic form. So, you know, they, um we, we don't know what they really look like well most of the time we don't so they you know we we tend to endow them with with human or human like form and um uh, so the you can read about them in, in in the old folk tales of elves and dwarfs and um you know all the beings which uh tolkien made famous but um but have have had different characters um, over the years. Now, for example, elves that, that those are land whites, um, but they Tolkien endowed them with the. Well, you can see his vision of the elves developing. It is diff it's different in the Hobbit to Lord of the Rings. And in Lord of the Rings, he has them as very tall, noble beings, uh, you know, sort of shining from within. And uh, they are ancient beings, almost immortal and very knowledgeable and magical. But in the Middle Ages, they weren't like that. You know, they, they could adopted various, they, they, we're usually small in stature 
and they were generally malevolent. You know, you were walking through a wood and you might get shot by an elf bolt, which would drive you mad or make you infertile or something like that. And all kinds of ailments, especially, you know, madness were, were blamed on the elves. And if, if you, like a, a, um, a, a child that was um, abnormally ugly or um, uh, mentally abnormal um, as a baby would be thought of as, as a changeling. You know, they'd say that uh, the elves had changed one of their own and stolen the human child and put a, an elf child in its place. And I think this was the um, the explanation, for example, for autism, because I, I, I've known, you know, a few people who've had autistic children, and um, you know that can be very difficult to bring up. Uh, and in in a couple of cases, you know, I, I've seen them; they have, you know, succeeded to, you know good healthy adulthood but in the in the early years have been exceedingly difficult you know because they they find it difficult to socialize in the human world and and to communicate in the human world and and i bring that into the book as well where um where, where the um, elf steward is talking about the you know, he says spitefully, you know, he, yes, some of them, some of us are among you. And, um, you know, you you call them changelings now, later they will be known by other names. You know, they, they, they find it difficult to survive in the human world, but one day their genius will be recognized. You know, and, and very often autistic people can turn out to be geniuses. So. I know my my son is a genius. I mean, he can do second and third grade math, um, actually fourth and fifth grade math, uh, math already, and he's only in first grade. <laughs> I have to salute that because I've always been pretty crap at math myself. So, oh um, no! <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, Matt. I just wanted to interject that <laughs> my son is on the spectrum. So, <laughs> yeah, same here. He's very good at math as well. Yeah. Um, well, um, we're getting close to the hour, so uh, is there anything else you'd want to uh, say about the book, I suppose? To say about the book, well, it's um, it's a work of imagination. It's it's not Norse mythology, and, and nobody should take it as um, uh, as, as a uh, some kind of authoritative book on Norse mythology. Gospel? You shouldn't take it as gospel? It shouldn't, no, don't take it as gospel, for heaven's sake. It, it's, it's purely my imagination of uh, the way the, um, the worlds might work. And, you know, who says that Snorri was right? He was only going by the law that he learned himself. Um, who says I'm wrong because I might have it right and he might have learned a lot of things that you know he um, he didn't know and this is the whole purpose of his journey is to correct the things that he got wrong and to you know he Snorri has because of his writing he's got noticed and so somebody has sent Shiner to him and said take him on this journey, show him it, everything as it really is and show him the things that he got wrong. And um, that's the whole precept of the book and the why and wherefore of why he should be done doing this, you learn right towards the end of the book. Yeah, and one of the most beautiful parts, but I won't give that away because that's not fair. But um, all the links will be in the description and... So you'll be able to find it on uh, lulu.com right now, correct? Yeah, it's on lulu.com. Um, you may, if you're ordering now, um, you may have to wait a couple of weeks because only tonight I uploaded a, 
a new and slightly corrected version um, that on reading my own book even after i'd approved the the draft i realized i got one word wrong and nobody had noticed it and uh, this is the peril of you know self-publishing is that or of publishing anything because you can't always rely on the publisher to correct it for you um uh i realized i'd got a word wrong so i've corrected that i also remember this time to put in the um, international standard book number on the copyright page so that it can go for general distribution i um what else did i do i corrected the page numbering and i took out the i unchecked the box that said explicit content now i said it at first it was explicit content because i'm an old codger who um you know was brought up brought up in a different era and i realized that the kind of stuff that i got it was the occasional swear word and the occasional sexual reference um so i thought well i shouldn't be so hard on myself because even my own kids were brought up with tv programs which are far worse than that you know so i i, I just unchecked that box and now it is easily to be found on lulu.com but i have to approve the new draft first before it will start printing again so that may be a couple of weeks but your other two um, books are available on amazon yeah the, those are available on amazon um, or from direct from the publisher Av avalonia okay um and the uh what, what else was i going to say I'm going to put, um, I'm working on putting out a Kindle version of Snorri. So, um, so you know, the, the, I'll be working with Amazon on that instead of Lulu. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Lovely to have you on. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, it all sounds so interesting, especially the elves. I thought maybe the Fae did that, um, where the Fae would kind of bring in changelings. But you're saying the elves do. So is it well, kind of interchangeable? Uh, or Yeah, elves, Fae, you know, it's, it's pretty much all the same thing. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, Chris, so much for coming on. I was so excited to talk to you. And of course, Matt was uh, very excited to talk to you about your books. Um, I am going to look them up, see if I can get the Kindle version. Um, you know, if I can, I definitely will take a look at it. Uh, yeah. Because I, I do have a Kindle. <laughs> um, well, that might take a couple of months, but um, oh, that's, you, you, that's you, a, you'll get it eventually. I, I think that should okay. be. I think that should should be popular. The Kindle version. Yeah, yeah you probably get a lot more downloads than you think. Um, now, uh, mm -hmm. I just want to ask you one quick final thing: uh, the Iceland magic. You said you had to be very precise on that. Can you kind of go more into detail why you had to be more specific? or uh get that correct i think you said oh yeah well okay we're looking back now to um autumn 2010 and i just moved to iceland i mean to to actually stay there long term and a friend of mine in england was working on a uh a new book called Occult Traditions, which was to be a compilation of, of various articles. And he wrote to me and said, could I write something on Northern magic? And I said, yes, I can. Um, because at the time I was working as a volunteer at the Icelandic Museum of, or the, the, sorry, the Museum of Icelandic Witchcraft and Sorcery. And so I was reading a book called Tvær Galdraskræðir, which means two books of Icelandic magic. And I wrote him an article about seven and a half thousand words analyzing all the spells in this book, of which there were, you know, maybe 160. So, um, 
I presented that as my fellowship work in the Rune Guild. And then moving on from that, I thought, okay, so what do I do for my master work? And I thought, well, this is quite a successful formula. I feel comfortable with it. I'll bring in another five books of magic. And nobody else had ever done this before. Uh, made a survey of, of six books of Icelandic magic and uh, analyzed each spell and tried to find threads connecting all of these. And so that, that's what I did. And I analyzed them very um, rigorously. And I had a spreadsheet, but also I had my own little, well, actually quite thick black bound book with scribblings through it with mad writing such as look at the shadow as well as the light and uh, things like this a bit like um indiana jones's dad's notebook and um so i i, I wrote all this and I, I had this massive spreadsheet with about 360 separate spells all analyzed and searchable on various parameters and um, and that became my masterwork in in the guild. You know, I I wrote it all up in about forty four thousand words and um, presented it. It was deemed worthy, and I was accorded the title of master. And then I thought, well, this is good enough to publish, and. Um, so I made a few adjustments to it to perhaps make it a little more reasonable, not many, and um, uh, and then published it. So that that I had, but I did have to be very precise, as you say. It's um, it, it's a semi-academic work. Hmm. That that's I think that's great. I mean, because usually we just throw stuff together and then just you know yeah it's yeah, intention well, the, they always say it's intention well the, the the guild sets a very high standard for its um for its masterworks and you know the the, the bar is getting higher all the time and um you know it doesn't have to be a um, a literary work or you know, and it doesn't have to be something like I wrote. It could be a book of poetry. It could be uh, 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 some music. I mean, um, uh, Ian Reid of Fire and Ice, his masterwork was his album Runa. And that was very inspirational to me and it remains inspirational for other people. Um, it, it can be anything, it could be a piece of, um, of pottery, uh, you know, uh, or a statue, or something like this. What one guy recently qualified, and his work is um, uh, creating sacred spaces, uh, so, you know, temples, in effect. Um, that's as a Wiccan. Uh, that's what we do. I mean, I my sacred space is this room, but I mean, that's that's very interesting. Mm. So. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I had to. Let's put it this way: I, I had to impress, and and that's why I had to be quite accurate because I, I was bound to get people coming back at me and saying, you know, have you checked this? Have you checked that? Um, you know, you're finding inconsistencies, and I expected criticism. Um, I didn't get a lot of criticism. Uh, I, I got some, but um, but basically, I, I, I made the grade. I mean, that's, that's really awesome. Um, well, Chris, uh, like uh, Matt said, unfortunately, we are out of time right now, but it was so much fun. I mean, this hour went like, you know, like it went really yeah. fast. Um, you're a wealth of information. I'd love to have you back. Uh, especially, uh, you know, when I do read your books and, and 
I, the spell book sounds awesome. You know, I kind of want to do a few now. <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's been a pleasure having you. Um, uh, thank you for the late hour. I know it is uh, probably almost three or it's after three o'clock there. Oh, gosh, yeah. It's, uh, it's <laughs> well up to three now, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. All his links will be down in the, the description field. Uh, if you want to like look at the books or uh, all his Amazon stuff, if you want to check those out, uh, Matt and I can get them together and everything will be down there. So you can click on whatever you want. And uh, of course, our links will be there. Uh, mine and Matt's and um, I mean, blessed be everybody. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, and as always, Matt, uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, are we going to have a guest on next week? He's from yes. California. Yeah. Yes. It, Lothar Tuppen. I'm sorry. What's his name? Lothar Tuppen. Okay. So we will have him on next week. I'm so excited. But thank you, Chris. We will have you on again. Uh, but thank you, everybody. And blessed be everybody.